So it's a pleasure to be here at Oro University. And uh, the reason is that there are very few institutions in the world which emphasize values and applicable knowledge as much as Oro University does. Right? And uh, I just came here for the first time 15 minutes ago. But as I stepped in, I felt something very distinctly different. You know, the whole environment is very different. It's sort of suffused with a spirituality that I have not seen in too many places in the world. So uh, it really is a pleasure. And given that your motto is learner to leader, and given that you are suffused with the Indian ethos, I thought I would talk about ancient wisdom and modern leadership, right? Because you're embarking your journey as, le as learners, and ultimately, you will become leaders. And in many ways, you are leaders even now. So I want to be a little thoughtful about that process, right? Uh, this is my 25th year of teaching. I've been teaching now for 25 years. And I have worked with students like you. I have worked with MBA students. I've worked with PhD students. I've worked with senior executives around the world. And there are things that I have picked up which I didn't know uh, when I was your age, that if I knew at that time, I think many obstacles that I sort of, not obstacles, many learning opportunities that I had as I was sort of moving in my own journey through life, some of those, some of those eddies and um, turbulences would have been uh, much less consequential, right? So, so I'm going to talk about this perspective. And all of this is based on my own experiences. So I will, of course, quote a lot of research. I will share with you a whole lot of written material and um, texts, quotations, etc. But all of it, all of it is ultimately based on my experience. So experience comes first. And it is in reflecting on the raw material of experience that I will sort of share with you uh, the perspectives that we will talk about. So, uh, you know, the, the great uh, poet, saint of India, one of the most remarkable individuals who was born anywhere in the world, Kabir, Kabir said, Tu kahe lekhan ki lekhi, main kahu aankhan ki dekhi. That is, you talk about things that are written, but I talk about things that I have seen myself. So I will, of course, quote uh, texts and research to support what I, uh, I, I'm going to be talking about. But remember, it is everything that I have experienced. All right? So, and by the way, please feel free to raise your hand. And of course, I will, uh, in, you know, I will pause at different times. Feel free to raise your hand and ask me a question at any time. This is meant to be interactive, and we'll try some fun things together, right? So any questions about the process? OK. So let me start. I'll tell you a couple of stories. So first, certainly in the Indian civilization, perhaps in the world, there is no leader who was perhaps greater than Krishna. Right? So if you think about it, we've all heard of Krishna. Right, Lord Krishna. If you think about it, his entire role in the Mahabharata and in his times is that of a leader. But he doesn't always lead from the front. He also leads from the sides at times. Right? And of course, the dialogue that he has in the Gita is very, very interesting. It's of course, as you know, a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. How old was uh, Arjun at that time? Do you know? Huh? Take a guess. 25. 25? Well, he wouldn't have had Abhimanyu at 25. That's for sure. <laughs> right? 33. Huh? 33. 33? No, but remember, Abhimanyu is a grown, is a grown warrior, right? 50. Above 50. Above 50, yes. He was actually 66. So he's 66. He's a warrior at, 60, at the age of 66. This is not very well known, but he's a warrior at the age of 66. Now, when he comes to the battlefield, when he comes to the battlefield, what happens? What happens on the battlefield? He wants to fight. 
wants but, it, but, but he sees his own brother and uh, family members exactly so like one thing is stopping him to fight with them so something is stopping him from fight from fighting right so here is the interesting thing what does krishna so he's not able to fight so what does krishna do does he t does krishna tell arjun about the latest weapon system the latest uh, strategy for fighting the latest tactics is what is it that arjun is lacking is it knowledge that he lacks obviously not right he's the greatest warrior on earth he and karna are the greatest two greatest warriors on earth so there's no knowledge about weapons or about tactics or strategy that he that he lacks so what is it that he lacks why is he not able to fight why is he not able to fight soul. sorry soul soul what about the soul the soul is stopping to fight the, the soul is stopping him to fight what else what do you think is stopping him his feelings his emotions attached his emotions that are attached what else is stopping him he sees the destruction he visualizes it as a warrior see very often warriors also make uh, you know the most the biggest advocates of peace because they see the destruction and therefore you know they more than anybody else know how terrible war can be right so yes he sees the destruction but ultimately so how what else any other thoughts on why values what is what are the values that sort of uh stop him family values family values right so essentially he says yeah very well put so at the end of the day what does krishna do krishna doesn't give him new knowledge he gives him a new perspective he says beta you're looking at the world this way look at it that way he just shifts the perspective from you know friends and family you know like an airtel calling plan right he says it's not an airtel calling plan it's not about friends and family it is about dharma so he shifts the perspective right second story uh one of the great books of all time uh it is one of the 10 best selling books in the last 50 60 years in the united states it's a book called um man's search for meaning uh let me actually put this here the book is called man's search just one second we'll make it work the book is called um man's search for meaning uh let me just write it for you here yeah now it's working and it's by Viktor Frankl. Now does it has anybody read this book? Heard about it? Take a look. You may want to buy a copy. If I'm from I'm sure it's in your library. You may want to check it out and read it. This Viktor Frankl was one of the great psychologists and psychoanalysts and psychiatrists of his time. He worked very closely with Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler and the other greats. But the interesting thing about him was that he was Jewish and like many Jewish people he was put in a concentration camp and nine he had a very large family and nine people out of 10 basically perished in the concentration camp. So it was the most inhumane environment that you can possibly imagine the Nazi concentration camp right He was one of the few who survived and when he came out he chose not to emigrate to the united states as most of his family did the ones who survived but he came back to vienna and then he wrote this book about his experiences and how he survived the concentration camp the most dehumanizing experience known to man and in the book he tells a story which is what i want to sort of share with you so he has been back in vienna now he heads the the main hospital there in vienna he is the director of that hospital and another doctor comes to him and says dr frankel 
I'm very depressed. So Viktor Frankl asks this other doctor, and he says, doctor, what is the problem? It's one doctor talking to the other. So he says, my wife died two years ago, and I'm very, very depressed. So he said, two years ago, you must miss her a lot. So he said, yes, absolutely. And he said, so tell me something. So he thinks for a while, and then he says, so tell me something. Did your wife love you equally? So he says, yes, doctor, she loved me equally. So he said, doctor, let me ask you a question. Suppose the situation were reversed, right? Suppose the situation were reversed and you had died first and she were here, how would she be feeling? What was his answer, do you think? How would his wife be feeling at that time? Remorsed. Remorsed. Similar to his own situation? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what he said. He said that he thought that she would feel exactly the same way that he was feeling right now. So you know what Viktor Frankl says? Doctor, look at it this way. You've just saved her a lot of pain and suffering. Right? So what does he do? What does he do? Does he give, does he give the doctor? The doctor is, remember, depressed for two years. He can't get on with his life. And as this doctor walks out, he says that it's as if the burden of you know, two years of depression is lifted. What does Viktor Frankl do at that time? What does Viktor Frankl do at that time? He changes the perspective. The perspective from what was his earlier perspective? Uh, he was feeling very depressed and that. Why? What was the perspective that led to that depression? The death of his wife. Death of his wife, but was it just the death of his wife, but something else? The love and affection. The love and affection, but something more? Loneliness. Loneliness, but the, what was the key perspective? See the word. This way. No, no, yes, but what was the key perspective that was keeping him depressed? He was missing her. He was missing her, but, but that is the consequence of that perspective. What was the key perspective? Memories. Sorry? Memories. Memories. What else? Memories. Look, the key perspective was that he was focused on himself. It is about my pain and suffering. When he shifts the perspective that it's not about my pain and suffering, it is about somebody else's suffering that I've alleviated, right? That the depression vanishes. So this is an insight which is very, very old in India. This is, and I'll come to that in a minute. And uh, Viktor Frankl basically gave a formula which I will come back to if I have some time. Um, I won't talk about that formula. If, if we have the time, remind me towards the end. He gave a formula, D is equal to S minus M. I'll share that with you later on if we have the time. But for now, for now, just focus on the fact that Viktor Frankl changed the perspective of the doctor who was in depression. Okay? And so, the interesting thing is, there is a distinction between knowledge and perspective. The psychiatrist may know everything, or a doctor may know everything about the working of the human mind and all the drugs that can cure depression, but very often they are not enough. And you require something more, which is what I'm sort of talking about. So the first thing to remember, and this was an insight that the Buddha had, which is, which I, which I will come to. But a third story. This is my own story. The story, so some years ago, my wife was in terrible pain. Terrible, terrible pain. For, for several days, she was in terrible pain. It was the most excruciating pain that she has ever gone through. Was that, was she suffering? Was she suffering necessarily, do you think? Does pain cause suffering? 
question. Does pain cause suffering? Yes. Yes? yes. Hmm? Yes. To some extent. Actually, it was the happiest day of our lives. So you can imagine what, what happened then, right? I remember it very vividly. So what do you think happened? A baby, our son was born at that time. She was in poor girl, she was in labor for 42 hours because, you know, you know like me, he was a big, big boy. So it took, you know, and she wanted to have a natural delivery. So he would just not come out, <laughs> you know, big head. So, you know, she kept on pushing and pushing and ultimately the doctor said, you know, this was around Thanksgiving time in November. He said, you'd be pushing between November and December. <laughs> so ultimately they did a caesarean section and he was born. So the question is, pain is not automatically suffering. But this was the, this was the key insight of the Buddha that pira, that is pain, does not lead to suffering, which is dukkh. Right? So you all understand he, Hindi, right? So pira, he said, is not equal to dukkh. The difference between pira, or which he, what he called Vedana in Pali, and uh, suffering is perspective. If your pain has a purpose, then it is not suffering. Right? Do you see that distinction? Now, why do I mention this? Why is this critical in your journey as leaders? This is what I want to sort of come to. So let me actually just uh, let me just um, talk about this. What is this? How many of you have seen this film? Okay, everybody. How many of you have not seen this film? Has anybody here not seen this film? Okay, one. Professor Mathur. So you have to enlighten him. How can he not see one of the greatest films of all time in any language? I mean, it is a masterpiece. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, so the only person in the room who has not seen it, you have to get him a copy ASAP. Because, you know, this, I love this movie so much that I even got a copy of the script for my son. You know, he loves this movie as well. So we actually studied the script as a work of art, which is what it is, you know, in many ways. But I want to talk about I want to talk about leadership and I want to talk about three idiots. Okay. So basically it's a story of it's 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 a very interesting film because it's a story of these three friends. And would you say that their are their perspectives similar on life or are they different? different. Very different, right? So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to ask you to tell me how the perspectives of the various characters in the movie determines how they behave. Right? Because the, the, since you've all seen this movie, right, with one exception with Professor Mathur, uh, with, Dr., with Mr. Mathur um, being the exception, since you've all seen this movie, we can have a conversation about this, right? I can't do this with any book, unfortunately. Uh, there are very few books that everybody has read in common. Uh, the Gita, I suppose we could we could talk about that, but and we did. But apart from that, there are very few books, you know, apart from Ramayana, Mahabharata, etc., which everybody has read. So anyway, so let's let's talk about the perspective of these individuals. <coughs> First of all, Raju Astogi. What is his perspective on life? So raise your hand, and I will call upon you. Yeah, go ahead, tell to me. Come first. To come first, but how? Dependent Yeah. So essentially, it's, you know, in Hindi as we call Ram Bharose, right? <laughs> right? What else? Yes, please. He actually wanted to earn money as he was not, he was quite poor. Yes. Money. So money, money had a lot of meaning for him. Money, important. There was a lot of burden. He felt burden, uh, bur he burdened. Boj, right? We say, Bhad Zavadas Boj Yes, please. So he had a very superstitious belief. Very superstitious. Very superstitious. 
What else? What else characterized his perspective? Yes. Blamed others. What else? Yes. He only thinks for his own family. Yeah, only thinks. Only thinks of his family. Yes. Sorry, lack of self confidence, right? Lack of self confidence. He was depressed. He was depressed, yes. Very, very important to understand this as to why he was depressed. Because of his family burden, because he wanted to fulfill all his needs of only family and to come up like, I only need my family, uh, like complete all his family dreams, his like sister, like mom. Right. Everything. Absolutely. Very well put. What else? Yes. He was wanting to carry away by others. Sorry? He was carried away by others. Yes. Very, influ very much influenced by others, right? as you very well put it, carried away by others, right? He was not his own master. He chased things. Huh? He chased things. He chased things. Afraid of exams. Afraid of exams. Afraid of everything. So this gives you a fairly good idea of his perspective. Right? Right? Farhan Qureshi. What is his perspective on life? And somebody who is a different person. Aimless. Aimless. Wildlife. Yeah, passion for wildlife. Afraid of his father. Just one second. Afraid of father. He was not doing what he wants to do. Again, depend yeah, again not able to do what he actually wanted to do. To do what he wanted to do. Lack of courage. He knew Same thing, lack of courage and family pressure. Right? What else? Yes. You have to do something new. Loving friend. Huh? Loving friend. Loving friend. Loving friend. Anything else? One last thing. What society takes. Yeah. So Zamana kya kahega, right? So this was this sort of defined him. Ah. Rancho, Ranchor Das, Chanchar Das, Chanchar. But really, his name was something else, right? Fansuk, Fansuk Mangli, right? So, so what about his perspective on life? Fearless. Ambitious. Huh? Yeah, cares for knowledge. For knowledge for its own sake, right? Doesn't care, care for future. Just one second. Just give, let me write it down. Uh, from the heart. Dil se, right? Let's just say, some of these things are better said in Hindi, right? So let's just say Dil se. And by the way, many of these are movie titles, right? Dil se, all of these. Uh. Loves freedom. Loves freedom. So free bird, Azad Panchi. Positive attitude. Talented person. Immensely talented. Master of his life. Master of his life. Self-inspired. Self Inspired a leader. Ah, we see this here. It's extremely important to sort of put this in here. What else? Practical. Sorry. He was practical. Practical. Catches? Dosti ke liye kuch bhi karega. Dosti ke liye kuch bhi karega. He did have fun but is limited. Yeah. Fun. Fun but limited. Loved his work. 
Self-confidence. Determined. Determined. <coughs> Determined. Hard working. In, any last thoughts? Ambitious. Ambitious. Wanted to bring a change in the society. Ambitious. Change agent. Zamane ko badal do. So he was all of these things, right? Against me, he raises his voice. Sorry? Rancho Galat Chiefs against me, Avaz Uthata. Voice against injustice. <laughs> I, we don't know his name, just the machine class prefer. Very quickly, we won't spend too much time on him. Any thoughts on him? Huh? Theory, Siraf Kiraya, so very different, very different from Rancho. The Rancho liked theory, but one last observation we don't want to spend too. Bookworm. Bookworm. Not thinking practically. Aha! <laughs> Virus! I hope you have no professors like him here. So, so Virus. Self. Huh? Self obsessed. So he. By the way, who in the world, who out of all of these characters is the biggest candidate for depression? Virus. Because it's all about me. It's all about me. The people who are most likely to be depressed are those who are always thinking about me. Those who are thinking about others not only do not have the time to get depressed, but will never in fact get depressed no matter what the circumstances. Just as Viktor Frankl didn't get depressed even in the concentration camp. I mean, you can't think of a more dehumanizing situation than that. So, virus, self obsessed. What else? Sorry? Multi talented. He was certainly very talented. You know, here he's writing with two hands, that tells you. What else? Punctual, obsessed with time. Time, discipline. Hitler, selfish, old mental thinking, old mental thinking. Ha, pakka engineer, right? Everything is everything is engine is an engineering problem. What else? Any last thoughts on? Sorry. He was wanting family, only doctors and engineers. Okay, yes, family. Only doctors and engineers. Extra competitive. Extra competitive. Super competitive. Sorry? I'm sorry, say that again. Sirf dil se, sirf se. Perfectionist. No dil. Perfectionist. So all this, all this basically is his mindset. Right? Similarly, well, Joy Lobo, I won't, I won't spend time on this. Ms. Qureshi Sahab, the father. Sohas, oh my god. <laughs> Price tag. <laughs> Posh. Donkey. Concerned about the society. Okay, I think I have to I have to put a <laughs> Ah. <laughs> Rattu, right? Silencer. Silencer. Bookworm. What else? Competitive. Topper. Well, wanted to be the topper. Overconfident. And overconfident and 
deeply insecure, which is a very deadly combination, right? Because deep down he was very insecure. Yeah. So desperate. desperate, yes. Bad Hindi. Bad Hindi. <laughs> Wanted to be successful. Show off. Show off. Selfish. Selfish. So, so anyway, you get the, you get the picture, right? So I think th this is the last character. I won't talk about Pia, but basically, so you get the picture, right? Now, what is interesting is that if you look at it, with the exception of Rancho, the beauty of this film is something interesting. With the exception of Rancho, the perspectives of all the other individuals, with the exception of maybe Suhash, changes in the movie. Right? So let's let's start let's just quickly take a look, right? So obviously Raju Rastogi's perspective, you know how it changes. You see Farhan Qureshi's perspective, how it changes. Right? You see, of course, Rancho's uh, I guess he's not that important. Virus, you can see how his perspective in the end changes. Joy Lobo, of course, unfortunately he died, so didn't um, apply. His perspective also changes to some extent, right? He is beyond redemption. <laughs> Chatur, not clear, but in the end, jhatka to lagta usko, right? He gets the second shock of his life. And maybe, maybe that leads to a perspective, perspective change. Yes, please. But then at the same time, he was not even confident because if he would have been very confident, then he wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, be fearful. Like he wouldn't fear his defeat. Like if he he had that confidence, then he wouldn't fear that somebody Absolutely. else will go. Absolutely. That's right. So people who are really confident enjoy winning, but also enjoy losing for a change. It's perfectly fine. That's part of life. The joy of winning is enhanced by losing sometimes, right? So, um, so this is, so the, the point that I'm making is the following. Ultimately, your perspective determines how far you will go in life, right? So let me actually share with you something that I had earlier. Um, which is this threefold distinction. This is knowledge. This is perspective. And this is action. Right? So, Gyan is what you are, what you get in books. But Gyan is never sufficient. Gyan is never sufficient. It was not for Arjun. It was not for the doctor. It was not for Chatur. It was not for any of the others that be in the movie that we sort of talked about. Knowledge alone was never sufficient. What you need is darshan. Darshan is often mistranslated as philosophy. It means philosophy also because philosophy is a particular way of looking at the world. But darshan literally comes from the root drish to see, drishti. And it literally means I'm looking at the world through this window. If I look at it from another window, I will see something else. So changing the window through which you look at the world is changing your drishti. Furthermore, if you want to change people, giving them a lot of gyan helps to some extent, but it takes a long time and the change is not long lasting. But if you change somebody's perspective, change can happen like that. In two hours, Arjun went from being a person who was totally despondent and couldn't fight to somebody who fought a battle and won. In two minutes, the doctor went from being depressed for two years to 
walking away with the burden being lifted from one's shoulders. So whenever that shift in perspective happens, that is when true transformation happens. And perspective is also integral to perspective are your values. So this is why it is particularly important to have this conversation anywhere in the world. And I do this. And I'll share with you how this conversation is important. But especially here in Oro University. Because I hope and I'm sure you will get a world-class knowledge base here from your teachers and your professors. But if that is all that you walk away from here, I would say you would have left 99% of the coins on the table. It's like going to it's like going to a treasure house and having all the treasure available to you and you pick only one coin and you come back and you leave the other 99. Because the other 99 ultimately will determine how high you go in life. That is your perspective, that is your values, that is your attitude. It is what made Rancho who he was. And even though in some sense Chatur probably had a deeper knowledge base, in the end, in many aspects of his life, he was a failure. And he was always this far away from catastrophic failure. Right? You saw that speech that he gives in the end, how it is almost a catastrophic failure. And furthermore, he is only this far away from depression. So the main thing that I urge you, you're just starting your college lives today. The main thing that I urge you to do here at Oro University is to pick up the values, is to pick up the drishti that goes. Because the beauty of how they have done things here or how you have done things here is that you have not only picked people for their jnana, but you've also picked people for their charitra and darshan. So the point is that if you have good jnana and crystal clear perspective, then the charitra or the actions, remember charitra, so the root for charitra is char, gai ghas charti hai. Char simply means to walk. Char simply means to walk. Acharan, right? It's, it means how the sum total of your actions. Charitra is the sum total of your actions. So it is your drishti which ultimately, drishti and jnana which determine your charitra. And if you want to change yourself, focus on this. Examine your darshan. Does that make sense? Now why? I did not know this four years ago. I just did not know this four years ago. Everything that I have just told you, I did not know anything of that four years ago. So how did I stumble upon this? And that's a story that I want to sort of tell you. As, um, um, as, your, uh, 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 as the introduction basically said, I do a lot of executive education, right? I, do, I work with senior, some of the senior most executives around the world. I work with CEOs in India. I work with CEOs in Pakistan. I work with CEOs in Europe. I work with CEOs in the United States. All over the world, I work with senior executives. And when I started to work with senior executives some years ago, and I started to reflect on how I could add value to people who know everything that there is to know about their business. So if I'm working with the top team of IBM, for example, or the country heads of IBM, or the uh, India leadership or the China leadership of Microsoft, or the top leadership of State Bank of India, or the country heads of PricewaterhouseCoopers, or all of these groups are groups that I have taught and worked with. IBM knows more about technology than I could know in a lifetime. PwC knows more about accounting than I could even conceive of in my dreams. State Bank knows more about banking you know, than, than I can spell banking, right? So they know, why do they come to us? Why do they come to me? They come because they want change. They don't come because they want knowledge. 
their time is too valuable to focus on getting knowledge. And in any case, any knowledge that they want, they can get through, the, through their institutions. They can put some people on the job and say, give me the latest thinking on this. They come to us, they come to me because they want something that they can apply at the end of a three-day program. Also, they don't have a lot of time. You'll be here for several years. If we are lucky, they'll be with us for several days because they're just very, very busy. But if they take that time to come to us, they want deliverable results. So if they do a program on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, they go back home on Sunday, and then on Monday they are back at work, they want to be able to apply that knowledge. And I found that in the programs that worked very well, I gave them some knowledge, but I gave them a new perspective. Ki beta tum aise dekh rahe the, exactly what Krishna said to Arjun, right? You were looking at the world this way, look at the world, look at the world this way. So when I started thinking about this, I said, this is very interesting. It's all about perspective. So then I started reading about this and it turns out that in management, which is my area, and economics, which is my area, very little has been written about this, not too much, even though it is central to the work that we do. So I started reading about this and it turned out that the same idea has been discussed in at least 13 different disciplines. And so for the past several years, I've been reading and reading and reading, and I have distilled the information that was in there and brought it to bear on the work like this. When I work with students, when I work with senior executives, when I work with children, in different ways, in different ways, I, I'm sorry, I think this phone is causing the problem. The, uh, so it's some version of this perspective that comes up. And then I started thinking, so when, where did this originate? Well, in, the, in um, modern times, it originates in neurosciences, where this is called the ABC distinction. A is attitude, B is behavior, and C is cognition. And A is the attitude is perspective. B is charitra and C is gyan. Cognition is gyan. The roots are the same. Cognition, gna, it's the same root in gyan. It's the same in Greek, gna, and in Sanskrit, gya or gna mean the same thing. So it's the ABC distinction in neuroscience. And then in reading our own philosophy, I realized that this distinction between gyan, darshan, and charitra is something that was made by the Buddha. It was made by Mahavir. It was made by the Sankhya gurus of the uh, of, of India all of these had made this distinction and as I said this distinction is at least 2500 years old in India that is it is your drishti which is ultimately important now some thoughts now given that I have built a conceptual apparatus for you let me apply it to leadership and let me give you and I will close here and then we can have a discussion. And in fact, you can ask me questions even before that. Let me give you four perspectives. And this is based on the work that I have just finished on doing a strategic analysis of how I am Ahmedabad was created. I'm sure many of you have heard about I am Ahmedabad. Uh, it is, um, um, I imagine all of you have heard about I am Ahmedabad, right? Yes. Okay. So we're not very far from you. But essentially, it's an institution of excellence. Uh, certainly, you know, if you look at the rankings in India, it's consistently number one in management schools. And globally also, it's in the top 10, 15, something like that in one ranking or the other. So basically, how was excellence created there? I, you know, I've just finished a paper, a fairly long one, of a strategic analysis of that. And one of the critical factors was the quality of the leadership and the perspectives that they brought to bear on that. And so I will share with you four metaphors that uh, were described for the leaders who built I am Ahmedabad. And there were three of them in particular that I would like to sort of describe, each with a metaphor. And there's a fourth metaphor that is used for many of them also. And these are all about perspectives, right? So the first perspective 
was the perspective that was used by used about Vikram Sarabhai. Vikram Sarabhai was one of the great institution builders, one of the greatest scientists of um, of modern India. How many of you have heard of Vikram Sarabhai? Okay, several of you have heard of Vikram Sarabhai. Okay. Those of you who have not may want to go to Wikipedia and just look him up. Fascinating life. I won't spend too much time on it, but he was one of the the idea for creating I am Ahmedabad was originally his. So he, it is said of him that he was like Krishna. So Professor Pisharodi from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research wrote about him that his perspective as a leader was that of Krishna. And in the Nilayam, which is a version of the Bhagavatam which is used in the South, here is a description that is used of Krishna. He said that there were th tens of thousands of gopis, but every gopi felt that Krishna was hers and hers alone. Right? There was a way that Krishna had, remember I started with Krishna and leadership, there was a way that Krishna had of making every person feel special. So special in fact that that person felt that Krishna belongs to me and me alone. So every gopi had that feeling. Vikram Sarabhai, when he was building I am Ahmedabad, the institution in the first couple of years, when he was also serving as the acting director, every person that he met went away feeling ki Vikram Bhai to sirf mere hai. That I have a special relationship with him. That connect, that perspective that Vikram Sarabhai had to make everybody feel special. A little bit of Rancho, you know, Rancho also does that. He makes everybody feel special whoever sort of comes in. So that is a Krishna-like quality. The second quality, uh, this was described of Ravi Mathai, was that he was Neel Kant. How many of you have heard of the concept of Neel Kant in Indian mythology? By the way, okay, several of you. So I'll come to you in a second. But look, myths are the most powerful way ever developed of getting people to change their mindsets. And no country in the world has a richer tradition of mythology than India. Even the Greeks, I mean, you put all the rest of the world's mythologies together and they will be a subset of the mythologies in India. We tend to sort of misunderstand the purpose of mythologies. Mythologies are not about gyan. I mean, you, may, you will have fairy tales in there, equivalent of fairy tales, you know, that the whole world was being, the oceans were being churned and there was a tortoise and then, a, uh, you know, then, the, then there was a pillar on top of it and then there was a snake that was being sort of pulled in both directions and there were asuras and devtas. I mean, it didn't happen, I mean, that is not knowledge. It didn't happen that way. What they're trying to do is through symbols and memorable stories, they're trying to communicate deep transformative truths that leaders can understand, that people can use to become better individuals. So the whole point of mythology is to give you a story that you will never forget for the rest of your life. So in some sense, it is even deeper than fairy tales. So Neil Kant, several of you raised your hand, what was in the Samudra Manthan that happened in any sort of churning? Remember, churning is about change. So whenever you are engaged in any change, and leaders constantly change and reinvent themselves. So what is, what is Neil Kant? What was the role of Shiva in that churning? <coughs> the poison came out. So when the churning happened, in any change process, good and bad things both come out. Right? So as they say in mythological terms, the wish and the amrit both came out. So what did, Krishna, what did uh, Shiva do? He drank the poison. He drank the poison, but, 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 but why, why is he called Neil Kant? <laughs> why? Why did? It, what is the significance of keeping it in the in the throat? Because it doesn't go in his stomach. It doesn't go into his stomach, right? So essentially, it's a it's a symbolic way of saying that he drinks the poison, but he doesn't spew it out, and he also doesn't let it go down and affect his system. So the quality of a great leader in times of change is that a lot of negativity comes out. He swallows that negativity, but doesn't throw it back on the people who generate that negativity. He just causes that negativity to decline. And he also is not affected by it. Okay. 
Now, by the way, for human beings, I don't know how Shiva did it, but for human beings, it is possible to get this quality of not being affected by negativity that comes through meditation. That's a whole separate conversation. You know, it'll take me several hours to sort of properly situate because there are lots of misconceptions about what meditation is and how it works and so on. As somebody who has meditated now for, uh, you know, 27, 28 years, it is something that I've also developed some experiences about and I, you know, I don't want to go into it, but ultimately it is the quality, quality of your meditative experience that determines how easily you can handle negativity in life, right? But having said that, it is extremely important to have that Neil Kant quality in an institution builder. So that is quality number two. The third quality that was also described of Ravi Mathai, the first director of IIM Ahmedabad, was that he was a Dattatreya, which is again a very interesting perspective that a leader has. What is a Dattat? Who was Dattatreya? Who was Dattatreya? Look him up. But anyway, the interesting thing about Dattatreya is that he had not one but 24 gurus in life. See, most people, so the reason, why, why is this symbolic? The, the reason why he had 24 gurus is this is a symbolic way of saying that he learned something from everything and everyone that he met. He learned something from the wind. He learned something from the sun. He learned something from the pigeons. He learned something from the king, he learned something from his own Diksha Guru. He learned something from the dancing girls. He learned something he was constantly learning. And he, and most importantly, he found something to learn in everybody. But simultaneously, he found something to praise in everybody because he was finding something to learn from. So if I find something to learn from you, I will also praise you for it. So this is a Dattatreya perspective of a leader. And the final perspective is the one that I will close with, is what I call the yagya, the perspective of a yagya. If you want to build a great institution, this is the highest perspective that you can have. And this goes to the heart of Indian philosophy because every yagya, every, not just every yagya, but every offering in every yagya has to end with a Vedic mantra. Do you, does anybody know what that mantra is? If, huh? Swasana. No, not Swaha. Sorry? Yes. Right, but that is. But that is used only once. But there is a mantra that is used after every offering. These are, by the way, these are all used Swaha and. Idam Namama. Idam Namama. So let me write it down. Uh, idam na mama. Sorry. Yeah, I will just explain in a second. Idam na mama. What does this mean? It's a pretty simple phrase. What does it mean? Idam means this. What does na mama mean? Idam na mama. What does idam na mama mean? It is not mine. It is not mine. This means it is not mine. Ye mera nahi hai. Because if you do a yagya for selfish purposes, it is not a yagya. It is a bargain that you have with God. It's a rishwat. It's a bribe. And it does, you know, it may have a small, a bribe may get your job done, but it creates long-term harm, right? Idam na mama is the exact opposite of the bribery attitude. It is, I'm doing this for the good of the world. It is very, it is very similar to the attitude that Viktor Frankl demonstrated that the depression is because you're focusing too much on yourself. So idam na mama is the highest attitude of a leader that whatever I'm doing is not for me. If I'm building an institution, if I'm building Oro University, it is not for me. It is for society. It is for you. It is for the country. It is for the world. 
And I do it in that spirit that I don't want to take anything, I only want to give. Then as a leader, if you have that perspective, as a leader, you nobody, there is no power in the world that will be able to stop you. Because people only stop people. People can never stop public purpose. Your questions. <coughs> yes. So all these things, like you know, Hindu scripts, you know, mantras, which are, which have very much significance even now, are written in Sanskrit language. So why don't uh, institutions and college schools teach, uh, like, make compulsory uh, Sans Sanskrit language compulsory for everyone? So there, there are political issues. I would urge you, I, so here is what I would say. That is something that will become political. So let me not get into, into that. But, but the one thing that I would recommend is that every one of you, how many of you have learned Sanskrit in some shape or form? OK, a fair number. OK, so I'm impressed. So the most useful thing that I learned in my life and that was by accident, because in Delhi they had the three language formula, right? It was Sanskrit. It is the single most useful piece of knowledge, Gyan, as a tool. Because 99% of the world's spiritual and wisdom literature is written in Sanskrit, or languages that are accessible to you because of Sanskrit, like Pali and Prakrit. So there is no better storehouse of knowledge where you can go and do your own manthan as I have done for the better part of 40 years, by looking into the Sanskrit literature and finding resonances. It's like the ultimate musical chamber. Every note possible in the universe is there. You just have to find out your own melody based on the notes of Sanskrit. So I would strongly urge you, and this is the perfect place to deepen your knowledge uh, of uh, our own scriptural tradition. And by the way, the scriptures of other religions also are replete with many of these themes. And I don't have time, uh, so I won't go into it. But whether you look at the Christian tradition or the, the Sufi tradition amongst uh, Muslims, or if you look at the Taoist tradition of China, all of these have deep resonances. And then, of course, all the Indian religions that grew up in India or have lived in India, they, uh, even Kabbalah, I mean the Jewish uh, tradition, all of these have resonances. Everything that I have said will broadly be agreed to by the others as well. So regardless of whether it is compulsory or not, voluntarily we should find a way that everybody should learn Sanskrit. And you know, many organizations like Sanskrit Bharati and others have made it easy in a week's time. If you devote one week during your holidays, you can learn reasonable Sanskrit so that you can start to read things for your own. The thing that I want to mention here is that most translations from Sanskrit are inaccurate because they reflect the perspective of the individual translating and the perspective of the time. Today, times have changed, so the same truth will be approached very differently, and it will have a very different meaning for us. So I urge you to go and read Sanskrit for your own. By the way, I do the same with Greek. I find some things in Greek that I do not uh, find totally in the Indian tradition. So I find it necessary to go and read the Greek in the original. I read a little bit of Chinese for the same reason. So that is the, that is, but Sanskrit, I mean, all the other languages put together and multiplied by 10 still don't come to, uh, the, to the kind of literature that you have available in Sanskrit, Pali, and Prakrit. Other questions? Yes, please. My sensor had taken uh, this uh, session here. Yes. And uh, there a time came when he asked uh, that, do you think about yourself? So there were like, quite a few who said that, yes, we think about ourselves 15 minutes a day. Today you got a point in that virus thing that uh, when you think about only me, then you are a distressed person. So he was like, if you don't think about yourself, why do you want pe uh, people to think about yourself? I very interesting, very interesting. So, by the way, are these two contradictory? Look, thinking about yourself with a view to improving yourself 
is one thing. Thinking about yourself to find a way to, to take advantage of others, that is something else. So if you think about yourself as to, as to how to become a better servant, so to speak, of society, that is all to the good. That is what is called Chitta Shuddhi, right? You basically make yourself, the whole point is that you, so in, in, in the Gita, uh, Krishna says, Yoga Karma Sukashalam, right? Yoga is the most efficient way of doing things. Karma su kaushalam. Kushal means efficient. Su kaushalam means most efficient. Karma su kaushalam means the action which is most efficient. Yoga karma su kaushalam. Right? So the whole point of the introspection is not to derive benefit for yourself, but to become more efficient at what it is that you want to do for others. And to the extent that we are human, I imagine a little bit of the I intrudes. That is okay. We cannot be a Gandhi. And by the way, Gandhi also didn't start out as Gandhi initially, right? In the end, he was totally dedicated. Even his body was dedicated to the service of the others, right? His entire self, his body, his mind, they were dedicated to the others. That takes a while. I don't think I'm anywhere close to it. But at least I try. And uh, again, as Krishna says, even a little effort goes a long way. And the earlier you start, the better it is. Other questions? Sir. Yes, please. Uh, you told about that formula D equal to S minus M. Ah, yes. So he said, depression is suffering without meaning. So if you have pain, but if there is meaning attached to it, there is no suffering. So depression only happens if you are suffering for no reason whatsoever. I have known, so here is something which is interesting. We tend to fear a lot of things. The happiest people that I have ever met in life were from the blind school, the school of the blind in Delhi. I don't know what they have done there, what it is that they drink, what is it that they eat, but going there feels like you're in the ultimate place of celebration. When I was growing up, I used to interact with some of them and uh, I said, I mean, how come, how is it possible? The thought of my losing my eyesight was incomprehensible to me. I thought, you know, this would be the biggest calamity on earth. And here they were without eyesight. And the point is that it is not what you have. It is what you make with what you have that ultimately determines how happy you are. And in fact, the most deliriously happy individual that um, you know, I have looked at all the wisdom traditions in India, many of them, I can't say all, but many, I've tried to look at as many as I have come across. But the one of the most deliriously happy and evolved individuals, somebody that is not very well known today, was a blind saint by the name of uh, uh, Swami Shraddhanand. And uh, he was totally blind from birth. But in talking to people who interacted with him, I mean, he died uh, many, many years ago. Before, and I only heard of him a couple of years ago, is that he was the happiest individual that most, I mean, he would laugh uproariously as if, you know, the most beautiful things were happening all around. You know, it's that, that joy. And it had nothing to do with that. And if you go on the web and look up Viktor Frankl's videos, one of them is about a person that he worked with who had, an, who had something which essentially reduced him to just a brain and eyes. He was a quadriplegic. A quadriplegic can only move the eyes and the, and the head and the mouth. So he could eat. But other than that, and in the, he had been, I think, injured in war or something like that. Other than that, he had no other facility. Everything else had to be assisted, apart from the eating function. Which, I mean, somebody had to put it in his mouth, he could chew. 
And this um, video has an interview with this individual who says that uh, after interacting with Viktor Frankl, he lost the whole depression part of his life. He became happy as a quadriplegic. Think about it. Think about it. Other questions? Yes. First of all, compliment for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know that in 90s, uh, we were talking more about the transformational leadership. Yes. And in 20s, we started talking about the servant leadership. Yes. Uh, my question to you is like keeping in mind the demographics and or uh, behavioral orientation of uh, employees in India because India is not only India now. True. You know, Facebook and many other organizations they are coming and <coughs> started doing research on the Indian employees, of course. whether they are customers or internal customers. So what do you think that because there is a very thin line difference between transformational leader and servant leadership. So what challenges you see? when we are going to implement the servant leadership because we are bothered about 80-20 rule also. Right. You know that. That has already reached to 90-10 also. So keeping in mind all the risk into consideration, what do you think that uh, will it be the good time to implement the servant leadership? Will it make people more dependent or independent on their leaders of the organization? Fascinating question. By the way, this whole notion of servant leadership was developed by some um, individuals in the United States, very religious in individuals who were very deeply embedded in their Christian tradition and who wanted to emulate the humility of Christ and built that humility into the organization. But if you read the book on servant leadership, the modern example that they cannot get away from and they quote extensively is what? Who's, whose example of servant leadership? Who? in history exemplified servant leadership more than any individual. Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. So if you want to know what servant leadership is, just think of Mahatma Gandhi. Servant leadership does not mean subservience. It does not mean lack of confidence. It does not mean that I assume you are the master and I am a servant. Servant means, can I be of service? How can I help? May I help you? And so, I would say that it's not just a question of now. This aspect has been important throughout history. And in fact, let me use an example from the Chinese tradition. So the Chinese tradition in the Taoist tradition, which is one of the wisdom traditions that I find, that I often turn to when I do not find some solutions in India because it developed independently even though it interacted very deeply with Buddhism when it went to China and a lot of those insights became universal but still it has, a preserve, it has preserved some things which are not fully developed in quite the same way in the Indian tradition. So there's a beautiful meta metaphor that is used in the book of Tao, the Tao De Jing by Lao Tzu. So essentially what he says, he asks this question and let me ask you this, why is the ocean the biggest body of water? It's a beautiful metaphor. It's a beautiful perspective. Why is the ocean the biggest body of water? And he, he gives the answer immediately. He says, because, yes, because why? Huh? Please go ahead. It's the collection of river lakes. Yes, why? Good, good insight. So how? Why is that? Because? They all need that one place. Why? Yes. So another insight. What else? Why? Remember, the Japanese tradition is five whys, so I've only asked you the third. In the fifth why, you will get the answer, or, or earlier. So third why, why? Why is that the collection? Yes. Because of, what, because of what property of the ocean? Because all these drain into the ocean. Exactly, and so why do they drain into the ocean? That's the fourth why. Because they are moving. No, why do they drain into the ocean? Exactly, exactly, because it is the lowest. It is the biggest because it keeps itself the lowest. And therefore, everybody flows, everything flows to the ocean. <coughs> because it keeps itself the lowest. So if you keep, humility is useful not as a pose. It will be found out. If you want to adopt humility as a pose, don't do it. You will be found out and it will be more harmful. But if you genuinely move in the direction of humility, it is one of the most affecting qualities that you can imagine. 
in any collective effort, people are so totally affected by humility, if it is genuine, if it is heartfelt, if it means that I want to be receptive to you. See, the thing about Mahatma Gandhi was, unlike us, we tend to hold to our opinions. He never held to any opinion. He held to his values. You could not shake his four or five values that he had. You could not shake them. That Those were not up to dispute. But his opinions, which are different from values, he was able to change at a moment's notice. In fact, he did you the honor, and uh, Louis Fisher, in his biography of Gandhi, mentions this. He says, more than any other individual in human history, Gandhi made himself vulnerable. He allowed you, on the fly, to change his opinion. If you said something, and he found that it expressed something better, or it encapsulated something better than what I did, or I understood, then I will immediately say, yes, you're right. I accept. The problem with us is that our perspective is that we hold on to our opinions, but we are flexible about values. Right? Uh, so I think um, Walt Whitman, the American poet, said, a f no, I think it was Emerson who said, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Consistency of opinions. Be ready to change your opinion when the facts change, but never be ready to change your values. Other questions? Yes. In today's world, who are the leaders? Sorry? In today's world, today, who are the leaders? You tell me. A leader doesn't get to be a leader by saying, I'm a leader. What defines a leader? Somebody should be ready to follow. So ask the followers. <coughs> you know, true, true leader. Yes, so a true leader is one who has followers. So you tell me, who are the leaders? Remember, do not ask leaders who are good leaders. So there's a beautiful poem in Hindi by Dhumil, right? One of the great poets who died very young. He says, Lohe ka swad lohar se na pucho. Lohe ka swad lohar se na pucho. Us ghode se pucho, jiske muh mein lagam hai. So do not ask about leadership. Ask about followers. So who do you think are the leaders? Whom would you follow today? Whom would you willingly follow if you were to stand here or she were to stand here? Whom would you follow? Myself. Yourself. So you are a leader. Who else would you follow? As a personality, maybe some legendary persons. Some, for example? Buddha. Buddha. Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. Today, in today's world, whom would you follow? I don't know that. That's my answer. But right now, we are only following you. <laughs> anyway, think about it. Last question. One last question, and then I will end. I think uh, we are, we've gone over by 15 minutes. So, one last question. Anyone? So, may I say? No, please, absolutely. One last question. Anybody? Parents as leaders. Parents as leaders. Parents are the first leaders, right? They are also, most importantly, the people who give our values. So, uh, in the Indian tradition, and indeed in all traditions, the role of parents is indispensable. The only person who was foolish enough to suggest that it should be otherwise was Plato, the Greek philosopher Plato. But I won't get into that, why he thought that and what. But the parents are the ones who inculcate values. And, the, and in more even so than the parents, it's the mother. right? So it's the role of the mother, which is extremely important and not surprisingly here as well. So, as you can see, we tried many new things today and tried them in a different way. 
And thank you so much. I mean, I, I've lost count of how many of you sort of, how many questions were asked and how many interactions we had in um, the 75 minutes or so that we've been talking to each other. So uh, for that, I thank you. And let me just end with a quote from uh, Bernard Shaw, who says, you see things and you say, why? But I dream of things that never were and say, why not? And that is all a matter of perspective, my friends. Thank you very much indeed.